So this is okay if it's sitting over here. The mic, you can hear me? All right. Um, thank you all very much for being here uh, tonight, and thank you especially to Michael for the invitation to be here, and Tarita for, for doing a lot of work of, uh, you know, making this happen. So um, I'm going to read tonight uh, poems from a third book of manuscript that I have been working on. So all of these poems are uh, fairly new. So, um, you know, there's problems with them, that's, that's why. Um, the first poem, we had a really wonderful afternoon today at the, uh, at the museum, and uh, I thought it would be nice to start with a, uh, a poem that um, meditates on art. Looking at the Romans. Looking at the Romans in the museum, the heavy marble busts on their white pedestals. I recognize one likeness as my uncle, the retired accountant whose mind, like a conquered country, is turning into desert, into the dust of dead things. The bust of an old man, as big as a god, its short, curled hair still rich as matted grass. This is my grandmother, a Roman on her deathbed, surrounded by a citizenry of keening, her breaths coming from the dark of a well, the plastic orange bottles containing the countless medicines, masked like an emergency on the table. The delicate face of the serious young man is another uncle, the one who lost his friends when the plane hit their aircraft carrier, the one who dropped pomegranate fires on the scattering villagers, on the small brown people who looked like him. One bust is of a noble woman. The pleats of her toga articulated into silky marble folds, her hair carved into singular living strands. She is the aunt who sends all her money home to lazy sons and dying neighbors. Another marble woman is my other aunt, the one who grows guavas and persimmons, the one who dries salted fish on her garage roof, as though she were still mourning the provinces. Here is the cousin who is a priest. Here is the cousin who sells drugs. Here is the other grandmother, her heart still skilled at keeping time. Here is my mother in the clear white face of a Roman's wife, a figure moving softly among flowers and slaves. The next poem I'm going to read is really quite new. It's, uh, it's an elegy for uh, the grandmother who was mentioned in the previous poem. And uh, the poem is in three parts, uh, and it's in three numbered parts. And the title of the poem is Chord, and that's spelled C-H-O-R-D. And I think one, one interesting I, thing I can tell you in advance is that uh, this grandmother died a few years ago at, at the really wonderful age of 92. And she had been a school teacher for about 47 years uh, during her life, an elementary school teacher. Chord, one, Annunciation. It is not always joy that is announced to you in the ordinary light. It is not always a wing or a flood of new knowledge delivering its atoms of change to your body. Sometimes it is a wound that is delivered, just as plainly as in those paintings, her head tilted up or down in an angle of responsibility and resignation there is no fanfare in the room other than some structure inside you made flat by what you have received. The heart, a putty-colored folding chair, knocked to the ground. And the room itself is emptied. This is part of the recognition. The room is a wound, the light a wing on the floor, the atoms of dust in the shaft and the quiet, which is grief's 
appetite to grasshopper. It was in the middle of the night, the middle of dying. The other houses slept, but we did not sleep. It was not dark. It was not dark. Memory, not so much a plow, not the fierce direction into the layered ground, but like light's refraction, light breaking. We surround the whole of the room of dying. We surround the whole of her mouth, the whole of clear air, the portal of waiting, watching that hole. The light breaking against bright surfaces, then alighting on others, on leaf and on face, on water that is gray as a breastplate. Light breaking on the oxygen tank, breaking on the instruments of medical measure, which are administered below the dresser's figurine Mary, her dress pink as a mouth. The light breaking against the daughter taking a pulse, breaking on the one praying against the corner, in the breath's duration, in the indrawn span of the breath. Why not see it simply as lost blood pressure, the breath's cessation, one unreleased gasp? Why not see it as the body parting with its function? Her face is like a fall leaf parchment. I am writing her face. I am writing a parchment love, the parchment I am writing upon. And no alarm in the arrival, something like a cheer going up among us, the accomplishment of her arrival, cheer and waiting. And memory, not so much catching as caught in the labyrinth designed like a thumb's whirls, caught while in wonder's order. Then there was the speck they saw in the room afterwards, the green live contraption of the grasshopper, the green contriving grief, the grief that is green even in December. Three. Threnody. Cord that is your satin purple dress, love and its good synesthesia. Cord that is your classroom's chalked board, its elementary figures. Cord that is letters, that is photo albums, that is rosaries, that is money. Cord that is the lion gold hills along the central valley, our sad I-5 songs, cord that is your young husband, outlived longer than he lived, cord that is a photograph of you among tulips, the field that is now no field, cord that is time, that is children, that is houses, that is countries, cord that is your name, conjugation for the sun and for consolation. Cord that is your throat, its hymns unabashed, unstricken. <sighs> That's hard to read. Um, she was buried in that garish purple dress. It was really the ugliest dress, but it was uh, also lovely for that. <laughs> she chose it. She had. A few days before she died, she asked to be buried in that dress. I'm going to switch gears. Um, one of the things that uh, I've been writing in um, this manuscript, uh, there's a strand of uh, political uh, concern in uh, the poems that I've been interested in tracking. Uh, uh, this this next poem is called Election Song. and. Uh, it might remind you of somebody that you want to think about or uh, not think about, depending on your political persuasion. Uh, election song. I want to be the governor of Alaska 
because the season is turning, because the trees are becoming an announcement, their leaves with the future already in them, the self-arson of the red leaves, the yellow leaves like superlative lemons. I want to be the governor of Alaska because I'm tired of the news, the newspapers, the public radio experts, and my own sad inability to sit quietly in my room, which Pascal declares is the problem with people. I want to be the governor of Alaska. Because from the air base and the army base outside my town, airplanes as gray as whales and as big as dreams keep flying over our houses shrieking like oversized skateboards on city sidewalks because of arsenic in the rain, because of arsenic in the ground, and the weather like a cold war always coming down from Canada and Russia. I want to be the governor of Alaska because I'm always hearing speech from the kettles and the doorknobs, those pure products of America, their soft words always scurrying things bothered by eyes and by light. Because I have been reading the letters of Vincent Van Gogh, the part where he says, instead of painting the ordinary wall of the mean room, I paint infinity. Because when he died, the world went dark by half. And when you went away this morning, the other half went dark. I want to be the governor of Alaska because of all the Filipinos canning tuna in Alaska, because of the mail order brides ordered by the lonely men of Alaska, I want to be the governor of Alaska, because of the pipeline on the state's chest like a bypass scar, because of the streams and flowers of the tundra, alive so briefly, they are like the gift of an election blooming every four years. I want to be the governor of Alaska, because of the price of gas, because of all the rosaries I prayed in my childhood, I want to be the governor of Alaska. Because even then, in childhood, I knew it was doubt that made people small. When I was dared to eat a caterpillar, I did. It wasn't shooting a moose, but still, it made me want to be the governor of Alaska. <laughs> As I mentioned in that last poem, I live in a town that has a big uh, military presence, a uh, huge army base there called uh, Fort Lewis, and then there's also a big Air Force base called McCord. And so this poem that I'm about to read is, is very much contextualized by that military presence. Uh, this poem is called The Man with the Crew Cut. This is February. The day is as good as dead tombed over by a month-long stretch of gray sky. I like reading almost as much as I like eating. I like both better than I like people. Today at the noodle shop, I get all three, where the bowl in front of me is dense with the essence of many things. Soybean fields, rice patties, green chilies and limes. At the noodle shop, I'm reading a book on the Japanese internees and their camps, the canine edges of desert mountains, the planks for walls, the laundry on the lines as gray as people. There's always a war on somewhere, someone making a sign to a protest, someone facing a biopsy, a city block flattened over and over, city by city by city. In the book about the camps, no one talks about their feelings. The noodle shop is warm because of all the people here. I am less myself and more like everyone else for a change. Outside, there is rain. The wipers waving valentine hearts across the windshields. That is where I am when he walks in the young man with only one arm, his glasses a little foggy, his yellow hair still in a crew cut. The poem
poem is a letter opener. The poem is a letter opener, and it is the letter that is answered or not answered. The letter that is held first by my uncle, who sorted it on his graveyard shift in the postal service warehouse, after which the letter became the postman going from box to box, each box a particular face like a dog's, the dog that is also a poem, its eyes dark like the water in a well, its fur smelling like grass, the grass that is also a poem, green and exclamatory in spring, later turning the color of rubber bands, the rubber bands which are also poems, holding together the pencils, the tip money, the small stone in the slingshot right before it takes flight, the stone that looks like a tiny skull, a piece of the night left in the middle of the day, in the middle of the road, the day which is also a poem, starting with its whisper campaign of morning light, the light touching the clean sidewalk, the light touching the sign in the barber shop window that says, no crying aloud in this barber shop, the sign that is itself a poem, like the dusk that comes like a cowl around us, comes to the sick uncle, to the thieving uncle, to the uncle who sleeps in the day, his sleep careful as a tea ceremony, or careful as a poem, a poem that is old and full of days, a poem like an old china plate, which is the color of time, the dusk finally having its supper of fog and people walking through the fog, the fallen leaves in the parks like strewn credit cards, the credit cards, which are also poems, like the typewriter writing the letter, one little tooth at a time, one love at a time, in our city of paper and crows. to keep to the time. I think this is the last poem. Uh, how many of you have heard of the, the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish? Some of you have. Uh, there, there's a flood of uh, translations of his work, uh, which have been coming out in the last year or two. And so I've been reading quite a bit of his work. And so this poem uh, that I'm about to read is very much a uh, uh, kind of homage to that reading. Um, the poem is called After Darwish. I want from love only the beginning, not this hillside above the twilight awakening city where you are more absent for being so present in my mind. The far cathedral is a gold nipple and the surrounding buildings are like silver and black boxes punctured by the lights which want to push out. I want from love only the beginning, not the seaside where we spoke away the night, the ocean and indigo sound, its edges appearing in melting white lines, while the fog stood away from us, out where the boats swayed like drunk holiday lights, the air weirdly still and warm. I want from love only the beginning, not the promenade and its rain at 3 a.m., the blooms of two umbrellas and our argument beneath them, as far apart from each other as the two burrows separated by the river, so that even the stone arc of the bridge couldn't bridge the arm's length we stood from each other. I want from love only the beginning not the confession you made on another hillside, another man, you said, another figure mobilized out of my dreamscape terror, the coat rack turning into a man with antlers, the ficus turning into a man with green skin. I want from love only the beginning, 
the beginning of one more conversation in a car, the beginning of a snow that leaves the day as white as a hospital, the beginning of an industrial dusk, the beginning of a new rain, rain that is the water of the Arno, the water of the Hudson, the water of the Mississippi, the water of the Nile. Thank you.